Hi, everybody. I'm Tracy Reese. It's so exciting to see all of you joining from all over the country and all over the world. I don't know if I've ever had such an, an amazing audience, so thank you for joining. I also would love to thank uh, Celine and Colin and Yasmin at the Slow Factory for inviting me for this class and helping me to create my, my presentation um, because, uh, yeah, the, the tech part is not my strong suit. So thank you so much. Um, my subject is fashion and culture and um, gave me a moment to sort of examine what that means to me and what I would love to share with all of you. And if we go to the first slide, you know, the first thing I did was to look up culture and, you know, there's what we all um, perceive culture to be, which is, you know, more around the arts and human intellectual achievement. Um, and then there's, you know, social institutions and, you know, then there's the culture of people and nationalities and religions and, you know, any social group. So those are the, the places that most of us uh, go when we think of culture. But I thought another interesting um, definition was the biological definition, which is to maintain in conditions suitable for growth. And I love how that um, meshes with sustainability and our, our, our goals in terms of sustainability, sustainable lives, sustainable fashion, sustainable everything. So I thought that that was one of the most interesting definitions of culture to maintain in conditions suitable for growth, makes it more personal. If we go to the next slide, um, I thought a lot about my family here and, you know, our ancestors, you know, sustainability for them was a culture and it wasn't fancy, it wasn't intellectual, it was just a lifestyle. It was about uh, making the most of what you had and not wasting. And we farmed, we made our own food, we sewed our own clothes. There's a picture here of my grandmother, Mary E. Cleveland, who is 103 and a half years old, still with us. And this is her in the 40s uh, wearing a hat that she made. And I love, I've always loved this picture because it looks like, you know, she's the Wicked Witch of the West, but like super glam. But that's how our ancestors lived. We, we didn't really have a lot of choice, especially uh, Black people in America. Um, there wasn't a ton of prosperity, but we created our own prosperity. Um, and I have notes here, you know, our grandmothers sewed, my mom sewed for herself. She had a super curvy figure and we couldn't always afford to go out and buy whatever it was we wanted. So she sewed and she taught me to sew and it was a, a means of self-expression for her. She was also a dancer. She was an artist. She was, you know, basically a woman ahead of her time. And my dad was creative in his own way, but he was raised in the South in Alabama in a very segregated part of the country. And, you know, they lived very simply and they appreciated everything that they had. And, you know, I always tell my, my niece and nephews, our dad, he whistled while he worked. He would do housework and whistle. He was proud to have a home to be able to provide for his family. He was an incredible gardener and created a beautiful, you know, world for us outside of our own backyard, um, our own back door. So, you know, it's interesting that we've gotten away from some of these simple principles. And, you know, I'm really so hellbent on kind of getting back to what's important in life and what our true culture is and not just the culture of consumerism or keeping up with the Joneses or 
what's on Instagram, but, you know, our true culture as a people and as a community and as a world. Um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about myself and my journey and hopefully, you know, be able to share some tips along the way. But I grew up in Detroit, Michigan, and I'm, I'm speaking to you from Detroit today from my home here. And I went to public school here in Detroit, uh, K through 12. And my mom was super involved in our education, made sure that we were getting the best education we possibly could, but they were passionate about keeping us in public school. And at the time, uh, you know, Detroit has always, you know, not always, but has struggled for, for decades, but there were still art classes for youth um, in public schools. I mean, I had art classes every week of my life going through, through public school here. And I also had music classes and chorus and, you know, all of these things enhanced my life experience exponentially. And my mom also made sure we had classes on the weekends. We'd go to the YWCA and, and have more art classes or swimming classes, just whatever exposure we could have to the beauty in life. And we, we spent a lot of time in museums and libraries. And it was an extraordinary childhood. And when I tell people that I'm from Detroit, they think that that means I had a sad you know, childhood and that it's a rough city, but that wasn't my experience of Detroit. And I've always been a champion of Detroit as my mother was before me. Detroit's always been a manufacturing city. And it's interesting that we as a country have gotten away from manufacturing and making the goods that we need to survive. And I think when we talk about sustainability and we talk about um, what we do and do not value, um, we circle right back around to, you know, we value the things that we make ourselves or that we have the experience of seeing someone we know make. But when everything is done out of our sight and we don't understand the experience of the people doing the making, then I feel that we often don't value the products that are made. And we're living in this throwaway culture where we don't really value um, a lot of things that we buy and bring into our lives. And I think it's important that we learn how to make things again, that we learn how to make things for ourselves, that we teach our children how to make things and how to be a bit more self-sufficient, take pride in what they've made um, and, and pass that on to the next generations. My mom uh, sold her sewing machine to me when I was 10 years old. And I thought she was going to give it to me because she had a brand new sewing machine that my dad had given to her for Christmas. And she said to me, no, nope, you can buy it from me for $10. And I was 10 years old. And I remember looking at her like, why do I have to buy it? But it was always important to her that we, we earned the money to get the things that we wanted. And then we would value them more. We would value the experience of working to earn them, and we would value those items more. And I bought the machine from her, and you know, there began my 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 life uh, sewing and making things for myself. And she taught me how to sew. And I also had home economics right in in elementary school, and learned uh, even more about sewing there. Um, but circling back to Detroit, you know, Detroit gets a bad rap, but this city has so much heart and it's got so much soul and so much perseverance. Detroiters are so resilient, you know, and we're, we're determined to persevere. And I want to be a part of, you know, um, showing the world um, this beautiful city and more importantly, the beautiful people of the city. And I think it informed so much of my culture as a person and as a designer. Um, so, you know, this, this slide says fashion is creating your own culture and, you know, gathering your own life experience and your own perspective, your own talent, your own skills, uh, your history, your family history is always going to be the best story that you can tell and share. So, you know, while we, we see a lot in the world of what others are doing and the amazing accomplishments of others, we each have the opportunity 
to show our own accomplishments and tell our own stories. And that's always going to be uh, the most dynamic. Um, fashion. Fashion in Detroit was a way of life. I mean, back in the day, especially, and, and even today, you know, Detroiters love to dress up, dress up for any occasion. Of course, you're going to dress for church. I remember going to church in New York and seeing people turn up in like jogging clothes and sneakers and jeans and t-shirts. And I was like, what, really? You're not dressing up for church? You would dress up to go to a restaurant. You would dress up to go over to your family's house. You would dress up. I remember my sisters and I making an entrance in our own home on family occasions. We would come down the stairs, you know, in a cute dress and have our hair done and have our special shoes on. And it was important. And I think we as Black people, and my mom taught me this too, it's like, you know, she never wanted us to be... Um, turned away from any opportunity. And she taught us to dress, uh, to be accepted. And, you know, I grew up at a time when, when you pretty much had to do that, but I carry that with me and I learned to enjoy it, you know? So any, the, the world is mine to enjoy. And I want, I want to dress for the occasion. And I remember my mom saying to me at one point, you know, if you had the opportunity to look good and, and you kind of didn't take that opportunity, you know, you're, you're so let down if you're in a room of, of, of fabulous peacocks and, and, you know, you're looking like a sparrow, um, then it's, it's, you know, it's a missed opportunity. So I always loved dressing. And I've got the kind of figure that looks best uh, dressed. Uh, casual doesn't really suit me very well. And I remember uh, going with my mom to Ebony Fashion Fair. And this, for a lot of people, especially people of color, Black people in this country, was our first exposure to fashion and to runway fashion and the theater of fashion. And we would literally you know, spend a few weeks sewing our looks uh, to wear to Ebony Fashion Fair, which was, you know, a product of, of Eunice Johnson, who was um, the wife of the publisher of Ebony Magazine. And Eunice was a huge couture fan and client, and she would go to the couture in Paris and in Rome and buy outfits. And she would buy outfits to put on the runway and take this amazing fashion show across the country and around the world. And there were all black models. It was real theater, incredible fashion, and it was an event. And it came to Detroit to the Fisher Theater every spring and we would have our outfits prepared. And there was always a promenade in the, in the, in the foyer of the theater uh, where you would show your looks um, at intermission. But that was my first exposure to fashion and, and the fabulousness of it. And on the next slide is uh, my, my other exposure, which was Soul Train. You know, we were in the house on Saturday mornings at 1230 to watch Soul Train every Saturday. And that was massive and you know the looks were killer of course the dancing was off the chain but the looks were killer and this was fashion and this was black people and you know it was the breakdown and the perfect afros and the top knots and the earrings and the platforms I mean all of it was like beyond fabulous and the host Don Cornelius with his wide lapels and the big giant tie and his perfect fro and wishing you love, peace and soul, you know, every week. We absolutely loved that. But this, this was fashion for us. And one of the most amazing things and favorite parts of my career is when I first started working, um, I worked for a company in New York called Arlequin and the owner was French and the designer for the brand was Martin Thibon, who is an amazing French designer who taught me so, so much. And we'd be on the phone 
talking about inspiration for future collections, you know, and she would ask me, you know, to watch Soul Train for her because she absolutely, you know, when she was in New York, uh, she would totally, she, she and Anna Sui were best friends and they would like, you know, sit down and watch Soul Train all day on Saturday and, and she would get so much inspiration from it. But she always wanted to know, you know, what I saw on Soul Train. That was one of her favorite inspirations. I absolutely love that. But um, yeah, so moving on, um, I was really fortunate um, that I got to go to Parsons School of Design and my teachers at my high school here in Detroit, Cast Tech, um, I was actually not planning to be a fashion designer. I, I wanted to do something creative, but I thought it had to be uh, something more serious, more technical. And so I decided um, perhaps I'd be an architect, but uh, one of my teachers saw something in my, in my work and she was like, you know, you should consider going to Parsons School of Design in New York. It's one of the, it's the best design school in the country. And I think you have what it takes. And that was Dr. Cleety Taylor, who was an amazing woman and a gallerist here in Detroit. And, you know, we would sit in our fashion design class. And yes, I had a fashion design class in high school. And we had a, a, a weekly subscription to W Magazine, which at the time was a giant fold out with incredible illustrations from all the runway all over the world, which this was my next level of, of uh, fashion exposure. And, you know, we had our own fashion club and all that. And I thought, you know, perhaps she's right. You know, I got, I got a scholarship to go to a summer program for high school students. And I went to New York and I was lucky. I had uncles living uh, in New York and New Jersey. And I was able to stay with my uncle in New Jersey and take the, the number 63 bus from Newark to New York every day for class. And my eyes were opened. You know, I'd been to New York as a child and it frightened me, all the, the, the hustle and bustle in the cars and the noise. But going to Parsons, every day and learning about the industry, not just, you know, this hobby that I had that I loved drawing and sewing and making things, but the industry of fashion and what it meant to our country, what it means to our economy. And, you know, seeing something very personal, be able to, to touch a broad range of people. And I, I came back to Detroit after that summer and I knew that I wanted to be a fashion designer, that I, I knew that it was a career. And I kind of had to talk my parents into it because we were first generation um, that was definitely going to college. I mean, both my parents worked their way through college. My mom, um, you know, was the first in her family to go to college. Uh, my dad, it took him six years to get his bachelor's because he had to stop, earn money and start again, stop, earn money, start again. But he, he did it. And he was the first in his family to be able to provide a college education to his children. So when it you know came time for my older sister to go to college, my whole family drove her down to Atlanta, Georgia. My mom, my dad, my sisters, my aunts and uncles, and my grandmother and installed her in the dorms at Spillman College. It was a big deal for our family. And so when it was time for me to go, you know, they questioned my choice of an art school, you know, cause I, had, um, you know, had a lot of invitations to go to Ivy League schools. I tested well and, you know, had a, a, a really good uh, high school grade average. And, you know, I was like, I, I really want to go to Parsons. I don't even want to apply to these other schools, which, of course, they tell you is a no-no. But I was accepted at Parsons, and they gave me a full merit scholarship. And my parents, they got behind me. And I know that if I'd been a male, if I'd been a boy, my dad would not have allowed me to go to design school. He made both my brothers get, uh, you know, their, their business administration degrees and their masters. And... You know, but luckily at the time, uh, it was okay for a girl to go to design school. 
And, you know, that began my career. And I was really fortunate to get my first job even before I graduated Parsons. And I worked for three years learning from Martin Sipon. And after about three years, my dad said to me, this quote here, you need to do your own thing. And my dad said this to me. And I was surprised. I wasn't thinking about having my own brand. I wasn't thinking I needed to have my own company. But the reality is, I think lots of designers experience this. You know, when you work for another brand, it isn't your pure vision, of course. It's the company's vision. It's the brand's vision. That's your job. And if you want to really express what is in your own soul, and um, your own personal culture, then you're going to kind of veer into entrepreneurship, which most of us are not prepared for out of school. And what I did, you know, I took my dad's advice to heart. I, I, I wrote a business plan. I went down to the Small Business Administration at, at Pace University, and they walked me through all the steps because I had no business knowledge. I was like a strict design school girl. And um, they, they, they took me through the paces and taught me about, you know, my financial plan and strategies and, and my, my, my sales strategy and learning who my customer was and what my price point should be and, and all of the things it really takes to undertake, you know, having a business. But I'll be honest, I was like 23 and a half years old. I graduated school early, I graduated high school early, I graduated college early, and I'd been working for three years and I was starting a business at 23. So I presented this business plan to my family and my dad financed my startup. And that was so generous and incredible of him, but it was also a huge responsibility for me. And taking money from family, using family funds for a venture that may or may not uh, succeed is a heavy responsibility. And like for the next 18 months, I basically lived on Rolaids because I, I didn't want to disappoint my dad, didn't want to disappoint my family. And I was fortunate we you know, got off to a fast start. We sold uh, Barney's. It was the birth of Barney's co-op and Jane Harkness took me under her wing and brought the line into the store. We sold Bergdorf Goodman. We sold a lot of fantastic specialty stores because I was fortunate I was in a really good showroom. And, you know, everything looked great from the outside, but I was robbing Peter to pay Paul. I was doing almost everything myself. The very first season that we shipped, my mom and my youngest sister, Erin, uh, drove a van from Detroit to New York and met me at my factory on 37th Street, a factory that was doing my production on the day of my cancellation. So the day that I had to ship all of my orders or they would be canceled. And I remember they pulled up at about two o'clock in the afternoon and I had friends in the factory with me and then we brought all of the stock down and put it in this van, drove up to my apartment in Harlem. I had erected like I, I, I put rails along the walls in the hallway so that we could hang the clothing and the, the walls were so thin that the rails sort of collapsed into the walls and everything fell on the floor. But long story short, we got everything picked and packed and boxed up and, and drove down to UPS and got it all shipped out. And, you know, it really took a village. And at the time, this was the late eighties, we were all doing our own thing. That was the culture. All of my friends that I'd graduated Parsons with had their own little businesses and we were, we were surviving and we would help each other. If someone had a huge, you know, deadline, then we would all, you know, get together and, and, and help finish everything so that they could meet the deadline. And if it meant running up and down the street with bolts of fabric on your shoulder, that's what you had to do. So that was the culture at the time of like this, this young talent, you know, finding a way to, to make it work. But after about 18 months, I, I had to close my business. The stock market 
flopped. I mean, you name it, there wasn't a chance of me getting larger investment to stay afloat. And I also, I needed to, to learn a lot more about myself. I had to find my own resilience. I had to get some more experience. The list goes on and on. So I worked for other companies for about, I don't know, eight years. And then that, that feeling in my gut you know, blossomed again, and I knew I needed to to start again. And I started the next version of, of Tracy Reese in 1996. And this was, you know, second time was the charm. And I was blessed to have a very strong, very healthy business for about 22 years. And I, I had business partners this time that were that were in the industry to some degree. They were they had a lot of back end support for shipping and accounting and and all of the the other facets of the business that are really difficult to manage uh, when you're you know one person, one one designer uh, doing doing all the back end work um, rarely leads to success. So uh, having that support really helped me focus on the brand itself and and the clothing and the creative side of it and we really blossomed and we got out of the gate really fast again and you know we gained a lot of international attention japanese distributorship we sold all over europe all over asia canada and the us um, and had multiple brands and licenses throughout the years and you know, it's easy to get caught up uh, when you're functioning at that level. And we had three collections that uh, we were shipping um, and each was shipping 10 times a year. So I was in charge of design for 30 drops a year uh, between the brands. And so you're just constantly you're cranking out product, you know, and I had, oh, this is me in my first business, right? In my apartment in Harlem. <laughs> Look at those illustrations. That was actually the collection, what, you know, there. That's, yeah, there's some memory lane. Anyway, um, but back to the last business, um, you get caught up and at a certain point, um, you lose a little bit of your culture, you know, your, your true self. And I learned so much in that business and I worked with so many amazing people and um, there was so much talent, so much fun. And I think we lasted as long as we did because we very much had a family culture within the business and it was very relaxed. Um, there were a lot of people who just gave their all to that business and who, you know, worked long hours to, to help create beautiful product and, and sell beautiful product. And we, for the most part, really enjoyed ourselves, but, you know, we were incredibly devoted to the business, you know, working 50 and 60 hours a week was, was not unusual. And that takes a toll as well. And I think, you know, at this stage in my career, I'm striving for balance and I, I want balance for myself and, and balance for everyone who works alongside me. So in about 2017, 18, I started to be more interested in sustainability, you know, as we learn more about our industry and its footprint in the world. It's a huge awakening and, you know, to have gone decades without really understanding, you know, the true cost of what we do and what's happening along the supply chain for us to be able to create some of these things that we love and we feel are so beautiful. Um, we have to, we have to make ourselves aware. Um, and the slide says, when we know better, we must do better. And this was kind of like the death knell for my, my old business because I remember 
my partners coming to me and they thought that the future for the, the business was for us to do volume production for a lot of the big box stores that were asking for product at incredibly low prices. You know, they wanted us to knock off our own blouses and sell them to them for $10. And, you know, I'm sure some of you out there uh, know uh, what it takes to create a $10 item and none of it is is pretty, none of it is pretty. And it was not or even our, our core competency um, to, to make a uh, product at that price point. But just to walk it back, for us to create something and, and sell it to a big box store for $10 for making overseas, the fabric itself has to be around a dollar. The, the people sewing these garments most likely are making less than a dollar to make an entire blouse, okay? Then the factory gets their cut. Then it has to be shipped and landed. So this, you know, dollar value of fabric is most likely synthetic. So we have high duties coming into the States. It's coming in most likely by air uh, or if it's coming by boat to, to save more money, yada, yada, yada. But if you're lucky, you're going to land this item, two yards of fabric, $2, you know, a dollar worth of labor just saying that makes me cringe, a dollar worth of labor to make an entire blouse. And then you're paying high duties and freight. So, you know, you're lucky if you're landing this item in the United States for $7. And then you're supposed to take some kind of markup before you can sell it to a big box store for $10. What kind of sense does it make? I don't care how many tens or hundreds of thousands of units they want to buy. It just didn't make sense to me at all for us to enter into that type of venture, especially when I was learning about the cost of our, of our, of our work um, and our footprint in the world. And I wanted to draw back. I wanted to get smaller. I wanted to regroup, rethink, reimagine, re-everything. And when you have a business um, that was the size of ours, it's incredibly hard to kind of put the brakes on and change direction. So we decided to part ways, my partners and I, and it was the right time. And, you know, I just thanked the universe for the opportunity to start anew. Uh, with greater respect for our planet, with greater respect for all of the people along the supply chain that are making the textiles, that are sewing the clothes and cutting and shipping and, and making it their lives work to, to make my dreams come true. And I was fortunate to go through a program um, at CFDA that was supported by Lexus, which was uh, the CFDA Lexus Fashion Initiative, which was like a nine month intensive on sustainable design and practices. And that was really the launching pad for my new brand, which is called Hope for Flowers. So the slide says the culture of hope for flowers. And I chose that name for a lot of reasons. It took me about a year to come up with it. Um, but it really expresses everything that I want to say because this speaks to my hopes for the planet. You know, how are we going to save our planet? Um, how are we going to be good custodians to our planet? But it speaks to my hopes for people too, and especially for children. And I think that, you know, children, adults, everyone, there's a seed in each of us that needs to be nurtured. And when we slow down and focus on the whole person and you know, the, all the opportunities that each person uh, should have, um, it changes your perspective a lot. And you know, I came back to Detroit a few years ago. I bought a house here because I wanted to have property here. Um, in the city and 
I was wondering, you know, how could I contribute to Detroit? How could I be a bit more a part of Detroit as a culture, Detroit as a people, my family, you know, how could I get back to my own roots and um, share some of what I've learned uh, uh, with people here and also learn from, you know, all of the amazing people that it's been my my honor to, to, to meet and collaborate with um, here in the city. So Hope for Flowers was a part of that as well. And, you know, Hope for Flowers is designed for women who, who want to be a part of positive change in the world, but also, you know, look good while doing good. And, you know, that's been my mission here in Detroit and it's been so exciting and incredibly gratifying. But I feel that, you know, Detroit as a manufacturing city is a perfect place for me to put down roots and create um, a new model for, for a fashion business, at least new to me. You know, we're a fashion business and we're a for-profit fashion business that also has um, a social mission and that putting those two pieces together for me um, is so incredibly important and it, it makes the work uh, much more uh, gratifying um, and I'm able to share uh, with my community. I'm able to, you know, train people into this work, into every facet of it. I'm able to uh, work with my community in terms of arts education. So part of what we're doing um, with Hope for Flowers and the pandemic kind of slowed us down a bit, but not for long. Uh, we're offering arts education for youth uh, here in Detroit on Saturdays. I always had Saturday art class and I wanna be able to offer that for young people here. Um, because only 20% of Detroit public schools have an art teacher. Um, and the city is working hard to improve those statistics. But after the bankruptcy, arts were taken out of most of the school's arts classes and music classes were removed. They just couldn't afford it. And when you Google right now, if you're a parent in the city and you want classes for your children, you literally have to take your child to the suburbs and pay high fees for them to enjoy um, what I had for free or for very low cost as a child. So what we're doing at Hope for Flowers is offering those classes. And we're also offering classes for adults uh, in the evening um, after work, probably on hump day. Uh, because I find that it's so important for us to gather as a community and create together, get to know each other. I mean, you know, after this year of quarantining, all I want to do is get out and hug somebody. And I want to know my neighbor. And I think we've gone through this long period of isolation, but we isolated ourselves before this even happened because we weren't working together as much as communities. I barely knew my neighbors in New York on my on my on like the floor of my apartment building. You know, I knew my next door neighbor, but I I didn't really know everybody. I didn't take the time to engage. And I don't want to be isolated that way ever again. That was self-isolation. That was a choice. You know, when we watch like house hunters right now, people don't want to be too close to neighbors. They don't want neighbors looking in. And it's interesting. I have a big old house here in Detroit with a giant front porch. And this house was built in 1912. And we see how culture changes over the years. Every house on the street has a giant front porch because it was important to sit on your porch and engage with your community and your neighbors. And as the years went on, you know, we see the houses that were built in the 30s have a smaller porch. And then, you know, on through the decades, this kind of self-isolation, you know, began to happen and everything moved to the backyard where you could be private. And it's, 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 so wonderful to have this front porch. Even during the 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 pandemic last summer, I I would have porch parties, you know, where we could sit outside, 
and and talk and I'd invite people over to hang out on my front porch and I don't care if someone driving by sees us you know I'm going to wave my my hand at them and and welcome them and say hello because I need to know my neighbors I need to be an active part of my community and it's interesting and exciting that fashion as a culture has a way of really bringing people together. Um, it's exciting, it's fun, it's expressive. Uh, people are curious, people are interesting, interested in it. And I can use that as a vehicle to, to spread this message. But what's also extremely important to me is to amplify the voices of other artisans here in Detroit. And we've been doing that with the assistance of, of NEST. I don't know how many of you are, are familiar with NEST. Buildanest.com, an incredible nonprofit that works with artisans and makers all over the world. And they've brought their Makers United program here to Detroit, which is amazing. Um, so they're really uh, being intense partners uh, uh, to people here in Detroit, helping entrepreneurs, makers, and craftspeople um, scale their businesses and uh, reach consumers um, and so much more. Um, so that's been huge and it's allowed me to also meet more artisans and, and craftspeople here and, and figure out how we can collaborate um, Hope for Flowers and other projects. Um, but the other thing that's incredibly important to me is to speak to our communities and especially urban communities about sustainability, you know, and this sort of brings it full circle, you know, when we talk about our ancestors and how sustainability was a lifestyle. It didn't have a fancy name. It was just how we lived that is accessible to everyone, you know, and whether it's, you know, simple practices like you don't have to use the clothes dryer for everything. You know, I, I run a little laundry and I hang it up and if something needs fluffing in the morning, then I put it in the dryer for 20 minutes on low and fluff it. But I'm using less electricity and I'm putting fewer particles out into the world. That's simple, that's accessible. But, you know, growing your own food, learning how to compost, recycling, this stuff isn't fancy and it's not just for the elite or those who can afford it. These are simple practices that, you know, just everyone can adopt and, and share. And, you know, just moving away from a throwaway culture is imperative and teaching our young people the value of earning their own money uh, to have the things that they want and hopefully they'll value them more and not you know toss them out um, in the race to to get the next thing you know how do we how do we value what we have how can we be more grateful uh, for what we have um, more always comes when we're grateful. It all begins there, um, but uh, we've had this opportunity to slow down and to go inward and, you know, consider all of this. And, you know, I'm hoping that we emerge from this moment um, richer and stronger um, in all the ways that, that truly matter. So, you know, part of our mission here in Detroit, uh, with Hope for Flowers is offering living wage salaries to, to women of color. Um, the average black woman in Detroit makes less than $17,000 a year. That's not okay. That's not okay with me. That's not a living wage. You know, so we're offering well-paying jobs and we want to set that example. Um, we want to attract and sustain a growing market here. I mean, there's an incredible factory that launched here in Detroit during the pandemic called Isaac, the Industrial Sewing and Innovation Center, that is uh, manufacturing clothing right here in Detroit, uh, training Detroiters how to 
Uh, so uh, production quality uh, clothing and accessories. And that's incredibly exciting to me. Um, and like I said, embedding sustainability in practice and education. We'll be having workshops at our uh, future home uh, for the community just to talk about these simple principles and highlight all of the amazing people here in Detroit and elsewhere that are already uh, setting a great example. And of course, we will be a hub of free expression and creativity because that's where it all begins. So, um, what advice would you give to aspiring designers and or entrepreneurs looking to work and make a difference in sustainable fashion? Wow, you know, so much. I mean, I think, you know, really learning about textiles and, you know, how they're sourced, how the, the, the fibers are, are harvested and, and, and uh, produced, I think is imperative. And there's a relatively small field of textiles that, you know, are doing uh, little or no harm to the planet. I mean, it's, I think it's impossible for anything to be 100% sustainable, but we can select things that are less harmful and where, you know, there's some, you know, technological advancement and, 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 and where you can trace, you know, where it comes from. This part becomes really challenging because traceability is really difficult. And, you know, there are organizations that specialize in that, but it's it's kind of expensive to, um, to sign on and to really uh, trace the origins of, of every fiber. Um, so that's something that I hope as, you know, sustainability becomes more and more important to consumers. I hope that there are so many more brands that are trying to work um, more responsibly that the cost of, you know, tracking and tracing and transparency becomes less and there's, uh, you know, not such a barrier to, to entry. So textiles is important. Um, knowing where you're, you're actually uh, producing the clothing, where you're cutting and sewing is important. Right now, I've been still working with factories in China, but these are factories that I've worked with for years and years that I've visited, that I've, I've been on the floor in the factory. I know how they work. I know how their, their, their workers are treated and what the quality of life uh, for the workers is. You know, um, that doesn't mean that you know, I can control uh, what goes on when I'm not there. And I think that, you know, there's a lot of pressure on factories right now to meet a lot of requirements. And it's, I don't, I don't think we're giving them the, uh, the tools and the financing to be able to audit themselves uh, the way everyone would like them to be audited. It's, it's an arduous task. It's very challenging um, to, to meet the requirements that we want them all to meet. And at the same time, most customers are still asking for, you know, the very best price they can actually make. So it's like, are we, are we allowing them in our, uh, our, our partnership with them to meet the standards that we all want to see them meet. You know, if I'm saying to you, well, I can only pay X for this garment, does that give you enough markup to do the auditing to make sure that uh, you're paying a living wage? You know, the list goes on and on. So it works both ways. We can't put all of the onus on the factories to, to, to be perfect when we ourselves are not perfect. So there's a lot of work to be done um, on that side, uh, but it's important that we are fully aware. Um, you have to walk into it with your eyes open and you have to make decisions more from your heart. You have to put yourself in the place of, of each person along that supply chain and say, what I wanna be this person, do I wanna live this life? And, you know, that's where it all begins.
and you can't tackle it all at once. It's a journey. Um, I don't know if anyone has reached the destination, this, this perfect destination, but you can begin somewhere. And it's important that we all understand that uh, we can start somewhere and that we must start somewhere. And once you master, you know, step A, then you can go on to step B. You know, it's like I, I decided to focus on textiles because that's like kind of 80% of the garment is, is what the textiles are. Um, and that's where I began, but there's so many more, there's about a thousand more steps along the road that I wanna be taking, you know, from, from packaging and components to, you know, uh, how we're shipping and where we're shipping from. I mean, the list goes on and on, but start somewhere. Don't try to take it all on at once. Um, pick your lane, pick the, the area where you feel you can be the most effective and go deep there. That's beautiful. Thank you so much for that. And someone else answered sort of along the same lines. Sophia is asking, I live in a low income area where it's hard to shop suitably due to either lack of accessibility or super high prices. I guess my question is, how can we make sustainability affordable? Right. And I think part of that is you know, it is simple things. It's like when you say it's hard to shop, are you talking about, you know, life necessities, food and things like that? Are you talking about um, clothing or fashion? Um, you know, this year we all cooked more at home um, and I definitely want to support my local restaurants. That's incredibly important. But if you buy less processed food and make uh, food more from more you know, cook at home from Whole Foods, um, and I don't mean Whole Foods the chain, but I mean just Whole Foods like natural foods. Um, go to farmers markets, uh, join a co-op. You know um, there are lots of food co-ops here in Detroit, and there's an amazing market called Eastern Market where all the growers you know bring their produce every every weekend. What I buy there is half the price of what's in the grocery store and it's fresher and the quality is better. So, you know, sometimes we just, we might have to go a little further, but I think uh, there are ways, but I think the simplest way is to, to buy less pro, uh, uh, processed foods. I mean, it's not good for us anyway, you know, the health, consequences are great, especially for people of color. Uh, so that's a, a place to start. And, um, you know, same as in clothing design and it's one step at a time, you know, uh, take on one area of your life at a time. Don't try to do it all at once, um, but you can be a part of uh, the sustainable movement without it breaking your bank. Natasha Mays says, as someone who makes clothes at home sustainably and in a circular way, I'm a bit concerned about how to scale up and keep my practice in such a growth industry. Any advice? Well, I guess Natasha, the question is, do you want to scale up? What does scaling up um, mean to you. If you want to, you know, create a business that will sustain you and whomever is working alongside you, um, then that's amazing. I think what we, in the fashion industry, there's this concept that, you know, every brand has to be huge. And it's, it's all about like world domination and, and being a part of a global market. And, and you know, how can I, how can I uh, build a customer base in China? That's the, the next growing market. And, you know, is every brand meant to do that? I mean, whose playbook is that? Is that your playbook or is that just something someone else did successfully? So I think the first thing is like understanding your product and your customer who your customer is, where they live, what they can afford to pay, 
and focusing in on that customer and trying to find a way uh, to meet them where they live and understand what size your business would or can organically grow to be, you know, without, without forcing it. Because I think we've been sort of bamboozled into thinking that bigger is better. It's not always better. You want to be profitable. You want, you know, prosperity for yourself and for your, for your team and your, your, your company and brand. But that doesn't mean we need so much more than we need, right? I think this is a really interesting question. It's by an anonymous attendee. They're asking, as a designer, are you more drawn to creating something completely new or reimagining what's already been done before? Honest, that's a that's such a good question. I I tend to it's a little bit of both. You know, you you your ego wants to put your stamp on it, but at the same time, when you're creating things that haven't been done before, there's usually a reason. You know, maybe it's not so useful that thing that's never been done before. Um, a lot of what exists exists for a reason. Uh, it has a, a use for us, a place in our lives. Um, I love creating things, creating clothing that serves a purpose in the customer's life. You know, that you have a reason to wear, um, that you want to wear over and over and over again. So that kind of one of a kind thing, that incredible art piece, uh, that was never my um, my forte, it wasn't my, my talent. I always wanted to to dress real people for real everyday uh, life. And that was more satisfying to me. I mean, there are a lot of designers that are just amazing at, you know, they make you imagine, they create, you know, fashion as art. And I love that too, but it was never my, my talent. I love that. Um, Lauren Zilm asks, any tips for creating and offering a free art program in our own community? Well, we're learning all that right now. And actually um, here in Detroit, I've been working with a few arts educators and, you know, trying to figure out the best way to go about this. You know, when we're dealing with young people, especially, you know, you need to create a safe space. I did a few workshops with Detroit Public Schools, like literally going into schools and, and creating a little curriculum for, for young people, which was fun. And I think, you know, that can be a good place to start because it's definitely different than you might imagine it. Um, so to try to work with your local school system, a lot of times they're really grateful when people want to give of their time and expertise to work with 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 kids and, and give them a different experience than their their everyday uh, school experience. So, you know, I would start out by volunteering a little bit uh, within programs that already exist, and then um, kind of collaborate with people who are already doing it well to develop a curriculum, um, and you know safety guidelines and uh, for young people, all of that is incredibly important. So I would start out by kind of, yeah, volunteering and getting involved in, in what already exists so that you can see uh, where the needs are uh, that haven't been addressed, uh, where you could add value. Um, but you can also uh, start learning and, and, and understanding, you know, how to how to navigate and and that's what I'm doing you know working with a few professionals here who do this for a living you know because I'm a designer so arts education um, implementing it is new for me I know I don't already have those skills so I think the best way to to involve yourself is is to meet people who are already doing it and give up your time Awesome. Thank you so much. I think we're, that's it for today. If you have any final words or where people can connect with you, you mentioned LinkedIn and Instagram. Um, yeah. 
Exactly. And thank you all. Thanks for your interest in this talk. Thank you to the Slow Factory for giving me this beautiful opportunity to connect with a whole new community. Um, love you all. And I'm wishing everyone the best and wishing uh, everyone a, a great emergence from this, uh, this, this cocoon, this quarantine that we, we've been in together and apart this past year. And I hope that, you know, you come out of it uh, even a better version of you. <laughs>